Hi everybody, my name is Dr. Lachlan James and I'm a sports scientist and senior lecturer at La Trobe University in Melbourne, Australia. And today we're going to be talking about the use of bands and change during strength training. So the use of bands and change provides an alternate method of overload during resistance training beyond simply just changing the sets, reps, recovery time, and the mass on the bar. So it's a really interesting way of tackling it. And what it does is it alters the kinetics or the force time characteristics of the lift. And it provides more load during areas or phases of the lift where there's a mechanical advantage and less load during phases of the lift where there is a mechanical disadvantage, relatively speaking. So for example, during a squat, at the top of the range of motion, you're gonna be able to produce more force. At the bottom of the range of motion of the squat, you're gonna be producing less force. And what bands and chains do is they add more resistance at the top of the range of motion where you're typically stronger and less resistance towards the bottom of the range of motion where you're typically weaker. So as a result, it starts to accommodate the force time characteristics of the lift and it provides this alternate stimulus for adaptation beyond traditional sets, reps and loading. Now the use of bands and chains can be employed to target any strength quality really, or the major ones at least. So you can use it to develop hypertrophy, maximal strength or power, but it seems to be most effective for the development of maximal strength. So that's what we're going to focus on today. So bands and chains were originally introduced to the West by a guy named Louis Simmons of Westside Barbell. Now he took it from the Russian Dynamo weightlifting group in the 1970s. Now the use of bands and chains allows for additional forms of variation in the training stimulus. So when it's typically employed in a powerlifting setting, the set's rep structure is typically fairly flat over the period that you're using bands and chains, and then the variation comes by way of how the bands and chains are used. So whether they're used or not, and then the magnitude of resistance that they add to the bar. An advantage for the use of bands and chains during a, an applied setting, let's say in sport where you have these long seasons, is the ability to train closer to failure over time. So what happens is because you can overload towards the top of the range of motion, but you don't have to overload towards the bottom of the range of motion, you get an opportunity to deload in the early stages of the lift, overload in the top stages of the lift, and you can end up with an opportunity to try to maintain strength for longer periods of time, which is really beneficial for sports that have an extended in season, where if you try to do a linear approach to training over time, you end up with long windows of time where your strength is relatively underdeveloped. And that's by design in many cases, but for periods of time where you need to maintain strength for, for long durations, then you need to find a way to alter the stimulus in a different way. And bands and chains provide an avenue to do that. Okay, so let's take a look at some literature to see actually what happens when we use bands or chains during our heavy strength training. What we're gonna look at first is some acute responses to the use of bands and chains. What we mean by acute responses is what happens right here, right now, when you're doing the lift. All right, so let's check it out. We've got this study here by Swinton et al. in 2011. And now what they did is they performed the deadlift at differing resistances, so at 30, 50, 70% one RM loads, but then they added chains. They added chains of 20% one RM and chains of 40% one RM additional load. So now we can take a look at the force time characteristics to see exactly what happens when you're doing the lift with the occlusion of bands and chains versus not including them. So a really good figure to look at here is this one here where they've got bar position on the bottom from 0%, which is the very start, all the way up to 100%, which is lockout. And on the Y axis here, we've got velocity. So we can look at how the velocity changes as a function of the additional load from the chains and across the, the position, so the displacement of the bar throughout the lift. All right, so we've got three conditions here. We've got, they're all with 50% one RM bar load, but then the two other conditions have added chain load of 20%, which means you've got 70% one RM at the top, 
and chain load of 40%, which means you've now got 90% of 1RM at the top. So in those chain loaded conditions, you've got more mass at the top and throughout the range of motion too. So that's gonna provide you with additional stimulus. But the cool thing is, is despite that additional mass, that additional chain load, in these early stages of the lift, you can see the initial stages of the bar position and then the bar displacement. You can see that the velocity is actually maintained in the heavy loads. So despite there being more mass on the bar, particularly at the top of the range of motion, in the early stages of the lift, you get the same amount of velocity. So you get to be more explosive from the bottom or just as explosive from the bottom as you would with a light load but you get more mass at the top to overcome when you add on the chain. So you get this strength stimulus at the top and you get an explosive stimulus in the early stages of the lift that you just don't see when you're looking at the bar load alone. So that's a real advantage there. So you can see, despite the heavier loads, which is the 40, 20%, you get a same velocity profile. Then of course, it does start to slow down as you get towards the top because of the added mass. And that's part of what you're looking for. Okay, so let's have a look at another figure here. So this is a really interesting one. Again, we've got bar position at the bottom. And what we have here is the 70% 1RM condition. All right, and we've got Without any chain load, we've got plus 20% chain load and plus 40% chain load. Now you might be going, how can I have 40% of 1RM chain load plus 70% 1RM of bar load? It's 110%. Well, that's because that weight is counted at the top of the range of motion when you're typically stronger. So you get an opportunity to overload that. At the bottom of the range of motion, that additional 40% 1RM is probably going to be negligible. It might be around two to three, maybe 5% of additional load. So if we have a look at the different stages of the, the bar lift, you can see in these early stages, it's quite similar across the conditions. What we have here is the vertical ground reaction force. So the amount of force you're putting into the ground. So it's quite similar across the three conditions, but as we get towards the final stage of the lift, so as we get towards lockout, you can see the additional vertical ground reaction force required from the lifter in order to overcome the chain load, which is really interesting. So you can see the additional force required by the chain load conditions, which is the middle one and then the one on the right for each of the different portions of the lift. That additional force required to overcome the chain mass provides a really potent stimulus for adaptation. Okay, so let's take a look at another acute study. This was by Dan Baker and Rob Newton from 2009 and looked at chains during the bench press. All right, so what they did was they had a given percentage of 1RM that the group did. So for example, maybe it was 80% 1RM and that was from bar weight alone. And then the other condition was 80% 1RM made up from a combination of bar weight and chains when measured at the top. And they looked at the velocity during the lifts. So let's have a look here. So each of these three tables looks at the velocity during the lift. So we've got mean concentric velocity, which is the average velocity throughout the concentric range of motion. All right, they've got the peak concentric velocity, which is the fastest instantaneous point during that range of motion. And they looked at the peak eccentric velocity, which is the fastest negative velocity during the eccentric phase, so when the bar's going back down. All right, and what did they find? So the two columns on the left here are the bar weight plus the chain weight, okay? And then the two columns on the right is the bar weight alone. So you can see when we're looking at the use of chains, so bench press plus chain set one, bench press plus chain set two, you can see that the repetition velocities are much higher, both for the best and for the set average, than over here, with the bar weight alone. And this trend continues as we look further down. So the peak velocity during that lift, you can see much higher in the bench press plus chains group with respect to the bench press weight only group. And that's the same eccentrically as well. So what this is showing us is that despite having the same amount of mass on the bar when measured at the top, you get greater velocity, so you're more explosive during the lift. So it can be really advantageous for the development of explosive strength when incorporating bands and chains into your lifts. Mm -hmm.
So while looking at a snapshot in time, so these acute responses to the use of bands and chains can be useful, what we really care about is what happens over time. So the adaptations you get from the use of bands and chains and resistance training. There's been a fair bit of literature looking at this, which is pretty good. So we can see that it is advantageous to incorporate bands and chains at the right time with the right cohort in order to improve strength power adaptations. But some key take home points are, it's best if you're already well trained and already strong for you to see any sort of advantage of that. You want to periodize it. Nonetheless, it seems pretty well explored that they have advantages when used at the right place at the right time. A couple of key differences between bands and chains. The first and most obvious is that chains are heavy and they're a real nuisance to carry around, whereas bands are pretty easy just to throw in your kit bag and take with you. The second difference is, is that chains create more of an unstable resistance when compared to bands, and that's gonna impact the lifts that you use them on. So for example, when you're doing a back squat, I definitely want stability there because of that axial loading that I've got. So for that reason, I'm probably not gonna use chains, but rather I'm gonna use bands. When you're doing something like a bench press or a deadlift, the range of motion is a bit less. So when you have the chains on, the chains can stay somewhat touching the floor at the top of the range of motion, which is gonna reduce any additional instability added by the chains. So you can get away with using chains for the bench press and the deadlift. And of course, with the bands, because they're quite a stable resistance, you can use those for any of the lifts, including squat, bench press, and the deadlift. Now, the other key factor that differentiates bands and chains is the way in which they apply resistance. So chains apply resistance in a linear type fashion. So for example, for every inch up off the floor you go, you add a given amount more resistance from the chains, and that's in a linear fashion. So whether you move an inch extra at the top or an inch extra at the bottom, the additional resistance is the same. Now, that's not the case for bands. The bands apply additional resistance as you get further and further towards the top. More importantly, it's additional resistance per unit of displacement traveled. So for example, if I travel one inch at the bottom of the range of motion with bands, it's not going to add a lot of tension. If I travel an extra inch at the top of the range of motion with bands, it's going to add much, much more resistance. So because bands are viscoelastic, they add this curvilinear type resistance to the barbell. And that's a real key difference between the nature in which those two types of accommodating resistance apply resistance to the barbell. So let's talk about how much extra resistance we should be adding on in the form of bands or chains. Look, it seems like you need at least 10 to 20% of the 1RM in bands or chains for it to be a meaningful stimulus. Anything less than that, and you're just not gonna see any difference at all. So then this raises the question of how do I know how much extra resistance my bands or chains are adding. Sounds complicated, but there's actually a pretty easy solution. So what you need to do is set the bar up so it's at the lockout position. And then after that, you're gonna chock in a bathroom scale underneath the bar and then you're going to read the number on the scale and subtract the bar weight. So that's going to give you the total resistance at the top of the range of motion. Now from that you can assume that the resistance added at the bottom of the range of motion will be zero so that you can then halve that top resistance and that will give you the average additional resistance applied by the band or the chain throughout that range of motion. Okay, thanks everybody for watching. Hope you enjoyed the video today. If you did enjoy it, please give it a like and subscribe below for more videos on their way soon.